Well, good morning, everyone, and I hope you've been enjoying your sessions. I know I've sat in on a couple of them, and uh, it's always um, it's always good to have you you guys participate. And, and from what I understand, many of you have really attended most all of the sessions. So, uh, kudos for that, and we appreciate you being here. Uh, we mentioned a little bit this morning that we've had some technical difficulties. Uh, my slideshow got corrupted and had to redo it a little bit this morning, so I apologize. It's a little clunky, but uh, hopefully a lot of the content's there, and I'm going to try to go back and put some of the pictures and other things that we had in it before. So if you go to it online later, you'll, you'll have all that. Um, and, and Jennifer already mentioned that her computer's crashed a couple times this morning. So uh, we're struggling, but we're going to get through it. And uh, if you'll bear with us, and, and certainly appreciate it. So next slide. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a project that was built along the Catawba uh, River, and it's one that it really, it, it's a great opportunity for us. It started out with looking at a trailway system. Uh, this project you can see on your map was the old Selenys plant. If any of you have been around long enough to know Hertz Selenys, and they made a form of acetate on the site, acetate flakes, that was used in like rain jackets and anything that had uh, kind of that nylon material. But obviously it was a, a 1,500-acre site, had a lot of uh, issues associated with uh, what they made there, a lot of wells that are still being monitored, but uh, most all of that has been remediated. It's still being monitored. It'll be monitored for the rest of life, but some of the areas we turned into park and recreation areas, and some of it uh, was allowed that was in the undisturbed virgin areas, actually has some housing on it, uh, some apartment complexes. We have a BMX site, uh, velodrome, cycle cross, Really, it's the only place I know in the southeast that has all five cycling venues uh, all in one location. So uh, we're, we're very proud to have that as part of our parks and recreation program. But the trailway system is what was really, really neat about it. And as you see on the map, I'll point out a few things. I started out at the top, you'll see Future Porters Landing. That's a, a site that's currently in the planning review process. It'll start development uh, sometime probably later this uh, spring or summer. And it's going to be an apartment complex that does overlook the, the water. Uh, pump House is an interesting location. This is the uh, original pump house that was built in the early 1900s to feed the, the uh, mills in town. So it had a couple miles of line. So the pump house literally pumped water out of the river down into the Rock Hill Printing and Finishing. Uh, and at one time, the Rock Hill Printing and Finishing plant had probably about 40% of the population of Rock Hill at the time working for it. It was the largest manufacturing industry under one roof. And that's where they had their water drawn. So uh, when it was no longer utilized for that, the pump house just sat there and it actually is in, in the water. But, uh, you know, with the riparian buffers and, and the waterway, nothing's allowed to be built into the, to the river. But a, a nice entrepreneur decided he wanted to build a steakhouse there. So uh, most, of, most of you are probably familiar with Roos Chris. And Roos Chris basically, um, through a private partnership, uh, they, they brought in the folks. So if you go there, it has a private label uh, called the Pump House, but it's the only structure that's still allowed in the waterway. And they had to do a lot of special things to make sure uh, it was protected. Uh, if there's going to be a flood, they have special steel walls that, that, that can be put up, a uh, very expensive structure that was done. And it has flooded once where, where Duke had to take on a lot of water that they just couldn't pass through fast enough. Uh, we knew it was coming. They gave us a notice, but it, it did flood out the bottom area and uh, didn't really damage anything, but they were aware that it was coming through. So again, th those were some of the concerns. Uh, next, you'll actually see the river walk uh, I have labeled here. It's a 2.3 mile stretch uh, of trails that goes along uh, the river. That was actually built before the project of the housing went in. You can see uh, on the map some of the projects, uh, the housing are still in development, some apartments and townhomes, and you can point out some of the recreational areas uh, that are the bigger areas where you have the actual BMX and some of the PR parks uh, along that way. As you come on down to the um, where a lot of the arrows are pointing, if, if you can read my handwriting, again, I apologize, this was kind of last minute. It says Catawba River Canopy. Uh, we actually have a trail that goes under Norfolk Southern's railway, and they wouldn't allow us to have a trail under their railway without protection. So if, if you're fortunate enough to use the trail at some point, you'll notice there's this nice shelter that extends a couple hundred feet out beyond the, the railroad track. And the point of that is just to protect folks walking along should something happen uh, to the trail, sparks or anything that might come off the train itself, that you're, you're, you're protected way outside the, uh, the railway right away uh, along the trail. So that was an interesting project, took a long time to build, but uh, we were able to make that work in, in the, the river buffer as well. 
moving on down, you'll see uh, actual River Park. This is a park that we created uh, a number of years ago. Many folks have used it. It has a kayak launch, canoe launch. Uh, it's a nice park with uh, some shelters and uh, really ha ha has served us well along the river um, in that area. And, and with the expansion of that and what's going up around Porter's Landing, we'll eventually have about a three and a half mile trail that will connect to uh, many of our other trails that are already in Rock Hill. And lastly, on this map, you'll see uh, the Catawba River Trailhead. Uh, we do have uh, some nice restrooms and access that if you want to get in the trail about halfway down, you can all obviously start up at the pump house. There's canoe launch and access up there, but we also have a trailhead to access it with restrooms near our wastewater treatment plant. Uh, and that's the structure that you see uh, listed. It says STP for sewer treatment plant. Uh, we call it our man trust or wastewater treatment plant. Um, so we do have a trail that goes back behind it as long as, as well as access to that. So that's kind of the quick and, and, and dirty. Uh, Jennifer's going to tell you a lot more about the recreation needs in the beginning. I wasn't going to follow her, but since um, we had to switch it up this morning, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, an, an example of a project. I'm going to tell you some of the problems that we had uh, doing this project. So uh, next slide, I'll talk to you a little bit about our riparian buffers. You can see uh, on, on the riparian buffers what the current regulations are in Rock Hill, and we've learned over the years that some jurisdictions have buffers, some don't. Many of the counties do. Uh, along the Catawba Waterway, we have basically a 100-foot buffer, and then we also have transition areas. So you've got a 100-foot buffer that really is supposed to stay undisturbed, and then a 50-foot transition um, or 25-foot transition that could go either side to get back out of the uh, actual buffer area itself. And there's a little bit of discretion that you'll note on there. And we went to put the, the trail system in, uh, obviously, in places that gets a little bit closer, and many of the times that was because the Selenix plant actually had already encroached that. It was built before we came up with the buffers. So a lot of the plant already had access and they had already cleared trees well into the, the buffer area and up right up to the river. So we did try to utilize that where it was already existing and tried to make uh, benches and, and places that you could actually see out, uh, maybe a fishing spot that you could actually see out into the, to the river as opposed to trying to clear new property. Next slide. Uh, this one shows you some activities uh, that can be placed in the buffer. And sorry, this slide's a little, doesn't, didn't line up exactly like it should have. I don't know why it, when I pasted it back in this morning, it, it came in a little clunky too. Uh, but multi-use trails is something that we allowed and it does talk about how you disturb certain areas and what areas cannot be disturbed. Uh, next slide. Folks often ask, well, what does your trail look like uh, when PRT builds trails throughout the city? So this is just kind of a, a quick design. If it's asphalt, this shows you the specs that we use. We try to stay with a 10-foot multi-path uh, on all of our trails now, whether it's uh, got a concrete base. Sometimes you'll have heavier equipment if we need to get back in there. And we'll talk about that in just a minute about some of the challenges like with emergencies. We, we have had folks that have gotten down in there and had heart attacks or become ill and you need to be able to transport and get them out our rescue squads, as well as our EMTs on the city fire department. Uh, they do have access with smaller gators that can get in and out, but sometimes uh, you'll need a heavier vehicle and we, we certainly try to accommodate those uh, with these paths. Some of the challenges, I'm not gonna read all that on the next slide, but you can certainly see, you know, some of the problems we had, you know, when you create an impervious surface along a, a, a protected area, you know, how do you, how do you handle that? Um, we tried to meander the, the trailway through. Some of this is a little bit closer to the river than we would normally allow. And again, that's where we took advantage of places that were already cleared and already into the, the buffer area. Other times you'll see the trail gets away from the river just a little bit. You can still see through the trees, but we tried to protect that natural look. So if you were kayaking down the river, you necessarily didn't look into the project and, and can see uh, really there's houses and development uh, back behind it. We even have the Breakfield home. Uh, we've had a couple water management group meetings there. Um, or it's really a center that they do rent out that you can have weddings and that sort of stuff. And, it's a cleared area on a buffer, and it's it's really nice um, to do that. Uh, I, I want to mention that some of the access points, um, you know, we tried to look at congestion points along here with, with any kayak launch or canoe launch. Mm -hmm. uh, and we found out after we opened up that, you know, we have a, a river launch with a lot of folks bringing rafts and certainly individuals doing it are great. Uh, we actually had commercial folks that were bringing it uh, that did create a lot of problem, a lot of trash. So we had to kind of change some of the policy and rules about dropping off. If you don't actually have a brick and mortar facility where you have buses that bring you in and out, don't tell everybody just to meet there. And, and at one time we even had the folks saying, uh, you know, if you miss your takeout point, 
that's okay, just call 911 and, and somebody will rescue you. Well, that's not exactly what 911 is meant to be or really how we want to uh, utilize this, this trail. Uh, next slide, please. We, we talk about uh, some of the trails in between the pump house, which again is part of the commercial district. Uh, you'll notice if you've been out there, uh, it, it's a great opportunity with some wine and cheese facilities, dog grooming, uh, really some unique facilities uh, along a residential area um, on that. But some of the key structures were how do we uh, how do we manage all that? And, and you'll see in here we noted that um, one of the challenges along the way is we find constantly people that are building within the area that didn't have a permit or didn't have the right permission or we had they had permission to do a sidewalk and they ended up taking advantage and doing way more than they should. So we, we definitely tried to make the best of those. Uh, obviously, if they cut down a tree, you know, you can find them, but you can't put the tree back. So we, we tried to make those work as best we could uh, all, all throughout that process. Next slide, please. Uh, when we started getting into the final acceptance, some of the notes that we had to deal with, uh, safety is always a key. And, and, and folks ask me all the time, what standard do you go by for safety along trails? Uh, we use the AASHTO standard. It's the same one that's used for most all sidewalks, um, many of the highways, parking lots. Uh, they go into great detail about uh, meeting those guidelines and, and as well as some ADA type guidelines to make sure that uh, we're, we're covering slopes and easements so folks in wheelchairs uh, can participate as much as um, as they can through a, a, a property like this. Some of the areas obviously get off into uh, wooded areas. That would be a little bit harder to traverse, but uh, certainly the main path itself is is accessible to most, most anyone. Next slide, please. Um, I want to spend the last couple of slides just telling you some lesson learned. If we had to do it all over again, what are some things we would try to do? Uh, one of those really being making sure there's there's good communication with the developers uh, and really even the contractors to review all the plans and make sure we all understand exactly what they were wanting to do, make sure the scope's clear. Uh, this was kind of a first project along the river. We, we certainly cut our teeth for the last 20 years on doing trail systems, but not really along the river and in protected buffers. Um, one of the other lessons that you'll see here, I really wish we had taken uh, more advantage, and we did some, but wish we had taken more advantage of some of our sewer easements. We have sewer lines that served uh, the plant that served really uh, a lot of Rock Hill. And of course, as you all know, sewer follows uh, many creeks, streams, rivers, uh, just because it flows downhill. So there's already a lot of sewer in, in the area. So a lot of that area was disturbed, but we really wanted to try to utilize as much of the sewer easements as we could. Now, in some cases, that meant going back to the original owner saying, hey, we have a right of way for a sewer line, but we also want to make sure we can put people on it. Um, and, and, and in a commercial area, that's not a big deal. If you have a sewer line that goes through a residential property, they necessarily don't want a lot of folks walking through their backyards uh, if that's where their sewer easement is. So we did have to kind of work through that and make sure we had the right permissions uh, to participate in that. But where the sewer corridors were used, uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, they were protected. Geofabric was used a lot to protect not only the sewer line, because you don't want the trail eventually uh, causing a problem if you do have to have vehicular traffic over top of it as well. Uh, next lessons learned page, please. In some cases, we found some sewer manholes that need to be adjusted. Uh, you know, many times, uh, if you've been around the water, you'll see sewer manholes that stick out of the ground. They look like these little smokestacks that go up four or five feet. And that's really to protect the sewer lines from taking on water in case beavers dam it up or in, in the case that the uh, the river does come out of the banks in certain certain areas, we want to make sure that the sewer line, the manholes particularly, are higher than those areas so that they don't take on water uh, that then has to go to the plant to treat rainwater. Uh, that's just not an effective, efficient or effective way to do it. So in, in cases where the path went right next to it, or in some cases over it, we had to adjust the manholes. Maybe we moved them over, maybe we could uh, just affect the grade or make the path eventually rise up to that area and then back down. Um, and those were just anticipations that the original path designer didn't intend to, uh, to really deal with the sewer. So we had to kind of work through some of those uh, connectors. Um, shared path, I can't emphasize enough, when you have trails that go way out of the way, making sure you coordinate with 911 uh, and they know how to get into those areas. In some cases, we have trails and access off PRT property, off the Manchester Wastewater Treatment Plant property, so that should we need to go rescue someone, whether it's a kayak, canoe, or, or swift water rescue, or just whether somebody wasn't feeling well and uh, had had to call in. We have mile markers, uh, really, not just every mile, every tenth of a mile. So folks, if they are feeling um, sickly, they can call in and give us the mile marker. And, and certainly the rescue folks know how to get there very quickly by those mile markers. And again, that, that's a key point. Uh, 
um, to know as well. And last slide, please. Um, we, we talked about some potential with overhead utility lines as well. Uh, when you start running into to power lines, you want to make sure that you're you're clear. And depending on how people utilize this trail, certainly some of the water lines that, or excuse me, the power lines that go over the waterways, uh, believe it or not, you have to protect it for sailboats or any other vessels that may uh, try to go down that has some sort of uh, pole attached to it. So we had to make sure that if we're going to open areas up for more uh, access, that you also can make sure you're protecting the electrical systems as well as anything else. Um, through there. Stormwater runoff is always uh, a concern. We want to make sure that, that even the trails are protected uh, from having erosion uh, that's caused by that or having people. Uh, I already mentioned the trash. Trash is always an issue, but the more you have people, uh, people do things. They pick up lambs and rocks and stuff, and a lot of times those, those trees and those root systems that might look unsightly, they're there to help protect the banks. Uh, sometimes they'll sprout, sometimes not, but it's a natural protection. So making sure the public's aware that uh, we really don't want to impact um, the area any more than we have to, but we want people to enjoy it, but at the same time, not, not create a disturbance to the existing buffer or, or to, the, uh, to the waterways. So that's the quick and dirty of, of kind of an example of, of one area where we've actually used the uh, Catawba. And it's, again, if you haven't been out there, I would encourage you to, it's a, it's a great, Great facility. It has good access with restrooms in, in multiple locations along the trail. Uh, it's very well marked. Um, it's only open, you know, uh, from from dawn to dusk. So it does close at night, just so people aren't walking in the dark because it's not a, a lit trail, per se. But uh, if you're into canoe kayaking, uh, great access access points along the way. Uh, you can all the go down to Riverwalk, get a couple miles in on some slow moving water, and would really encourage you to try it out if you haven't. And I think Jennifer, um, after your presentations, I believe we're going to take questions on, on both. Yeah, thank you so much, Jimmy. Um, yeah, if you guys have questions at all for Jimmy, feel free to continue to drop those in the chat, and we'll um, we'll you know, those and we'll have questions right at the end. Uh, now I want to pass it over to Jennifer Bennett. She is the Recreation Project Manager with Duke Energy and is going to talk a little bit more about recreation on the Catawba across the, the full system. So Jennifer, I just want to see if you've got, if you're able to share your screen still. I am, and you'll have to forgive me. I have to look away for a second while I get this shared. You know, multiple screens. Um, Sabrina, it says host disabled participant screen. Now, yeah. when you came back in, you lost your COVID. Ah, yes. Okay, are we there? Yep, looks good. Perfect, excellent. Okay, well, thanks for having me. I appreciate this is always something that I look forward to in talking to this group. And um, I know you've heard a lot about Duke Energy's involvement on the Catawba Watery um, in different facets during this program, um, but I am here to talk a bit about specifically recreation and Duke Energy's role in recreation on the Catawba Watery. And so <clears throat> I wanted to know there's the, actually, this is a full team meeting for us. So there's three of us who do recreation planning for Duke Energy um, and management. And Christy Churchill is the other recreation planner and Paul Keener, who I think both are in this, um, are, are part of the recreation team. So um, I'll jump right in and, um, and give you a brief overview of why we do what we do and exactly what it is we do. So uh, public recreation planning at Duke Energy is a part of the Water Strategy, Hydro Licensing and Lake Services Group. And we're housed under the Regulated Renewable Energy Group. And <laughs> recreation project managers at Duke were charged with the planning, the implementation, and the long-term management of all Duke Energy recreation sites and facilities across North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and we have one site that's located in Ohio. So we work really closely with the hydro licensing project managers, and those are um, the PMs that are responsible for essentially the entirety um, of obtaining and then the man or management and compliance points for our hydro licenses. Um, and that those hydro licenses are issued under the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC for short, I'm sure you're familiar with that term by now. Um, and I believe Jeff Leinberger discussed in a previous presentation that these operating licenses cover a wide range of topics. Um, and they really work to balance all of the uses of the project or, or the lakes. Um, including recreation. Okay, let's make sure it goes to the next slide. 
Okay, so the majority of Duke Energy recreation sites provide access to the waters utilized by Duke Energy to create electricity or generate electricity, whether it be hydro, nuclear, combined cycle plants, um, but the largest portion of our sites are located on projects licensed by FERC. Um, and in addition to these sites specifically built for water access to water, I'm sorry, these sites are specifically built um, for access to the waterways. Um, we also manage about 44 miles of the Foothills Trail, and that's associated with our Bad Creek license that's located in uh, Western South Carolina. So with the majority of our recreation sites being located on hydroelectric projects, I thought it might be beneficial to give a quick overview of the relationship between FERC hydro project licensing and the consideration of recreational development and public access within those FERC issued licenses. And this speaks to essentially why Duke Energy is involved in recreation and provide recreation. So in 1935, uh, the FERC amended section 10A of the Federal Power Act to acknowledge recreation as a beneficial public use. And then in 63, an order was issued requiring a recreational resource plan to be filed with all major license applications. And then in 65, FERC issued order number 313, and that ensured that license related recreational development is consistent with the area needs where that project is located. Um, and if you'll note, in general, these actions are they're coming on the heels or in the general time period of major growth and recreational use of natural resources um, in our country as a whole. Okay, so FERC order number 313 is important to us in the recreation world and it essentially um, lays out the charges for a licensee, in this case Duke Energy, um, and, and what we do and how we plan for recreation. And so the points are noted here and we'll read through them, but it highlights um, our charges. And so we're to acquire necessary land to provide recreational resources that are associated with a project being the lakes and include that land in the FERC project boundary. We develop and ensure that public access or that the public has access to recreational facilities on the project um, and consider the needs of persons with disabilities and the development of these facilities. We work with stakeholders in the identification of public recreation needs um, and cooperate in creating plans to meet those needs. And I think cooperating in the creating plans is an important point there. Many of you are involved as stakeholders in that process, um, but it is a, a collaborative and cooperative process. We encourage governmental agencies to provide into, to pri and private entities to assist in implementing recreation plans. We cooperate with governmental agencies in providing facilities for recreational use of project adjacent public lands. Um, and so if you think a lot of the Western projects are located in the middle of uh, forest service lands. And so there's a lot of coordination that goes on there. Cooperate with governmental agencies in providing facilities for recreational use. Uh, my apologies. <laughs> I got my bullets mixed up. Uh, we comply with government regulations and the operations of recreational facilities and cooperate with law enforcement to develop regulations as needed. So that really speaks to the management of our access areas once they're built. We manage waste associated with project recreation facilities. So literally we take out the trash um, and provide recreation facilities without bias or discrimination. And we inform the public of the opportunities for recreation of the project and the rules associated with using those projects. So if you've ever noticed, sometimes you'll see a press release come out in the newspaper um, or public notice about um, facilities that are opening or that will be opening associated with, with a hydro license. Okay, so as we kind of drill down into the Catawba Watery, because those rules apply to every hydro license that's out there, that 313. When we talk about the Catawba specifically, I'm sure you know by now there's 11 reservoirs, almost, almost 1,800 miles of shoreline and almost 80,000 surface acres in the Carolinas. Uh, we have 58 access areas on the Catawba Watery, and this number is very quickly expanding. We're going to talk about our recreational build out under our 2015 license, but um, actually within the coming weeks and months, we're opening a number of additional sites. Um, and with over 16 million visitors a year to the lakes and river reaches of the Catawba Watery, Duke Energy actually is one of the largest recreation providers in the Carolinas. 
And so as we'll talk about in a bit, uncontrollable events such as droughts, economic peaks and troughs, um, like we've seen over the past couple of years, um, maybe even a pandemic, greatly impact the visitation and, and the demand that's put on these recreation sites. Okay. So I'm sure it's been noted in several previous presentations that um, Duke Energy submitted the Catawba Watery License application to FERC in 2006. And that 2006 license application application included conditions from the Comprehensive Relicensing Agreement, which we'll refer to as the CRA. Um, and that agreement was created by participants from over 70 organizations that all had vested interest in the river and its resources. So it's worth noting that there are recreation commitments that are in the CRA that aren't included in the license or our recreation management. And so those commitments include things like funding agreements, um, construction projects that aren't located within the FERC project boundary, um, <clears throat> or the leasing of lands and transactions, or uh, leasing of lands um, or any type of land transaction projects. So Article 407 of the Catawba Watery License specifically deals with recreation commitments and required Duke Energy to submit a recreation management plan. Um, and that submittal had to occur within one year of the license issuance, and, and it's for FERC approval. So the recreation management plan was submitted. It was approved in 2017, and that plan addresses pretty much everything that's associated with the development and the management of license-related rela recreation projects. Um, and so that ranges from what activities will and won't be allowed at access areas, how Duke will manage those activities, it gets down into the really nitty gritty as far as what signage is going to be included at sites, um, our best practices that we're going to follow during the improvement of existing sites or development of new sites. Um, and it also, I think, very importantly addresses how Duke Energy will monitor recreational use and needs of the project, and then how we will move forward in any revisions to the recreation management plan to account for changes in use. Um, or maybe alterations to the existing plan. So overall, there's 89 recreation enhancement commitments over a 20 year period. We'll enhance 32 sites with additional amenities and then we'll build 26 new sites. Um, and that investment totals about $45 million in the first 10 years of implementation. And that $45 million was uh, calculation during licensing. And so of course we've seen escalation in that with um, just escalation in building expenses, materials, things like that. As I mentioned before, there was also funding commitments to partners for recreational development um, not included in the, uh, the CRA. And these commitments totaled over $4 million. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so as I mentioned, this, the CRA really lays out the roadmap for the development of the RMP, including the implementation schedule of how we're gonna get everything done that's identified um, as commitments. So that schedule divides the RMP into um, five-year commitment increments. And as you can see, the majority of our projects occur in the first 10 years of implementation after the approval of the RMP. So our first five-year period concluded at the end of 2022 and due to some construction challenges and delays, there was a lot that happened in the past three years or so. Um, we have several projects that were included in a, a timeline extension request that was filed with the FERC in late 2022. So you may have projects in your area that were impacted by this that you thought were going to be done at the end of, of the first five-year period, late 2022, where we've seen some extensions for those projects. All of those projects are currently slated to be wrapped up by the end of 2023. So to date, we have 16 license-based recreation construction projects that have been completed. We actually have eight projects in active construction. So when we talk about recreation implementation under a hydro license, I think it's important to think about it from the perspective of recreation that's complementary and supportive of the project. And so the project being the lake or the waters. Um, and, and that's opposed to simply providing access 
to the water. And so if you've heard um, our team talk about recreation, a lot of times we, we speak of it from, does it have a direct nexus to the water or to the project? Does it create a specific experience because it's located on or adjacent to the water? And this is particularly true under the latest Catawba Watery License. With license-based recreation facilities such as picnicking, trails, wildlife viewing, and other forms of recreation really making a, a, a prominent occurrence in that plan. So if you think about the most common use of the lakes and the rivers, when these a lot of these original access areas were built, it was boating, it was fishing. Um, there's a large number of access areas that subsequently have just a boat ramp and a parking lot, maybe a courtesy dock to help get in and out of your boat, but not a lot of additional support facilities. And so as recreational use and demand for the, of these lakes has increased, it's also grown to include more than just that fishing and boating. People not only want to recreate in the water and on the water, but they want to recreate near it. Um, and so there's that need and demand for recreational opportunities adjacent to the lake. Um, and then as well as there's been much more focus to the additional support amenities for the existing facilities, restrooms, um, you know, benches to sit and take a break while you're, while you're enjoying the, the water. As a result of that, the recreation growth, um, or common recreational growth improvements uh, include restrooms, fishing and wildlife viewing platforms, and we're going to show those in a second, picnic facilities, um, and, and larger facilities such as swim beaches and campgrounds. And so ultimately, these improvements will create not only better access to the water and getting on the water, but a more diverse user experience and recreating in and near the water. So essentially, you don't have to have a boat to enjoy the lake. So these, these are examples of some of the facilities that I just talked about um, that have really become common, common facilities, particularly on the Catawba Watery as we, as we build out. So while there are several access areas um, that are leased where lessees have developed swim beaches, um, one particularly on the Catawba Watery, Duke Energy had 11 swim beaches identified in the CRA to be constructed. Um, and we, at that point, we only had one swim beach that was constructed in, in, uh, in management, and that was not on the Catawba Watery. It was up on Lake Glenville at the Pines Recreation Area. So we built and opened the first swim beach under that Catawba Watery build out plan at Molly Creek. And if you're familiar with it, um, I, have a, I have a large overview picture on the next slide, but it's located on Lake Watery and it opened for the first time for the 2022 recreation season. We've had positive feedback. It's, it is a busy, busy site. <laughs> um, uh, also fishing piers and platforms are common installation um, and they're important to providing access to the lakes and the tail races as well, the dams. And so um, the tail race is the area that's immediately downstream of the dam. And it is a favorite fishing spot. I'm not a fisherman, but the aeration of the water as it comes out of the station, um, it is prime for fishing. And so those are really valued facilities to our recreational users. Um, the benefit of fishing piers is they help to centralize uh, fishing use because when we, were, when we have areas of really heavily dispersed bank fishing, uh, we can see a lot of erosion. There's a lot of dispersed trash issues. Um, and also in, in solid fishing here helps us work with our wildlife resource agencies to identify the best space on that site where a fishing pier is gonna be most beneficial to its user groups. And then we can also locate things like fish attractors there uh, to enhance the fishing experience. We also have been installing uh, wildlife viewing platforms. So oftentimes our wildlife viewing areas and our fishing piers are put together. They kind of naturally go together, but not everywhere where there's a desire to have wildlife viewing is necessarily appropriate for a fishing pier installation. And so this is an example at Lucia access area. It's up on Mountain Island. It's a shallow, um, it's a shallow kind of backwater area where a fishing pier wouldn't make sense there. Um, it would be in the dry sometimes but the wildlife viewing there is phenomenal. And so this is what one of those facilities looks like. Okay. So I have two examples here of recently completed projects within the past couple of years. They're both on the Catawba Watery. 
Um, Corbetting Bridge access area is located on the Johns River. It's just above Lake, Ro Lake Road Hiss. Um, and Molly Creek access area, like I noted before, is located on the west side of Lake Watery. And these sites are very different in size and the nature of the facilities provided, uh, each one of them really meeting a specifically identified recreational need or needs of the area and where they're located. So you'll see Corpening Bridge offers a parking area and it's hard to see, I don't know if you can see my, can you guys see my cursor? No. Oh. Um, the parking area is here, but then you see have- it, Jennifer. I'm sorry, Sabrina, go ahead. We can't see your cursor when you move it. Perfect. I didn't want to be showing it to myself. <laughs> uh, we have a wildlife viewing platform here, and then you have canoe kayak launch here with a boat slide associated with it. And when I say boat slide, I mean, it's like a handrail that has a cradle in it that you can place a boat in and then slide it down to the water so you're not sliding it down the steps. Um, and Molly Creek, as you can see, is, is very different. Um, it has a number of facilities. As you come into the site, there's two fishing piers located on that site. Uh, there's two boat ramps <coughs> here with a courtesy dock in the center. And then you have a swim beach area here with two large picnic shelters and restrooms um, on the site. So those are two examples of very, very different recreational installations, but both really meeting the specific needs of the area um, that were identified by stakeholders during the relicensing process. Okay, I can't let a 2023 uh, Duke Energy Recreation discussion go by without talking about the Great Falls projects. And so these, <clears throat> this is another example that we have of recreation commitments that were included in the license. And many of you are probably familiar with these projects, but essentially Duke Energy had a commitment to establish both environmental and recreation flows into the long and short bypass reaches in Great Falls. These channels are situated between the Great Falls Reservoir and the Cedar Creek Reservoir, um, and they were both created or bypassed with diversion channels. And so Duke Energy has been working for a number of years to determine the best way to provide those flows into the channel. And the picture on the right is of the long bypass reach and the structure that we're using to deliver those flows. So essentially it shows you, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you here, we have two separate channels in this structure. This is the diversion dam if you're not familiar with it. So this used to be a continuous structure. There wasn't a hole here and there wasn't a hole here. And it was determined that we were gonna deliver flows through a passive method, putting them through a structure. So the water moving into these structures are reservoir elevation dependent. And what you have here is, this is the boater bypass channel. So uh, if you're a paddler and you're coming to use recreation flows, you'll paddle across the reservoir and you'll enter the channel here and you'll come down this channel, you'll come back through this channel, and then you are in the bypass channel to paddle the rest of it. This channel over here is min flows um, and so this is how we deliver our environmental or min flows to keep water in the channel at all times. And so while this is designed to pass a paddler or a boat or whatever through it, um, it is not the identified or preferred method <laughs> to paddle. Um, this is the channel to do that. So um, we're really excited about this project. <laughs> our flows are starting in mid-March and it has been um, something that we've been looking forward to in the paddling community and the community of Great Falls has really been looking forward to. Um, it's a unique project. Um, it is, we feel, an important project. Um, but where I really want to highlight here are the recreation facilities that are supporting the access, particularly to the Great Falls. And, and let me back up, and I, I didn't include a picture of it because the construction is, is not completely done yet. But the short bypass channel, which is the other piece of this picture, um, is also formed by a diversion dam, but that structure actually installed Obermeyer gates. So Obermeyer gates are inflatable gates that can be lowered or raised, um, and they've been installed at the crest of the dam, and flows will be delivered into that channel by lowering specific sections of the gate to allow the water to release into the channel at different CFS rates for different commitments. So the photo on the left, though, is of the nitrally access area. And that access area is going to serve as the put-in area for the Great, oh, I'm sorry, for the Great Falls Reservoir, um, and also the access point for that long bypass reach. 
And so this site offers river access as well as an interpretive site, which was restored as part of the project, but will be managed by Catawba Valley Land Trust who owns the property. And so these are some pictures of um, the historic site. And this is what the put-in looks like. And so I'll talk to kind of site design and, and consideration in a little bit, but you'll notice this is, this is different than our normal boat ramp design. And so we spent a lot of time talking about how is this site going to be used? What are the needs there? You know, are we going to have um, uh, rafting outfitters putting in there um, as well as the general public? Do they need steps? Do they need a ramp? And as you can see, we landed somewhere in the middle. <laughs> we thought there would be a need for both. Um, the site is unique in that there will be flat water paddling that happens. There'll be white water paddling that happens, um, oftentimes at different times, but oftentimes maybe at the same time. And so that introduces a lot of opportunity for interaction of those two different user groups. Um, so there was a fair amount of consideration that went into that. And you can see that as well with the size of this parking lot. And so we have parking spaces that are designed to accommodate vehicles with trailers. We have parking spaces that are very specifically single car. Then we have some parking spaces that could have done or could, uh, could serve both purposes. We incorporated some lay down areas for unloading if we had raft trailers, things like that. But I think it just kind of highlights the consideration that goes into these sites. This did happen to be a low water time. So have no fear, there will be water in the channel here <laughs> to access the Great Falls Reservoir. Um, this, I will point out, this kind of gives a, a high level view. This is the Great Falls Reservoir. So this is actually right here. And this is that structure. This is why it's under construction. You can see a crane crane up here. And then the short bypass reaches down this channel over here. So you'll be able to access both if you desire to from this one access area. So you can tell by the amount of time I've talked about it and the, the number of pictures. Uh, we're very excited about this project. Um, and I wanted to include these, these photos, and thanks to Christy for providing them. Um, this is what it looks like in action. So this is the channel, the boater bypass channel um, that looked like it's been coined the paperclip. And I'll, I'll go back, you can kind of see why. It looks a little bit like a paperclip. Um, but the rabbit that that boater was sitting in is this right here. So I'll go forward again, right? And then this is the turn. And so this area is this right here. So this is what it looks like. And while we know, you know, the reason for construction for this is to get paddlers from the reservoir into the bypass reach for paddling, um, we think that it will be enjoyed um, as a structure itself as well. So. Okay. So we talk a lot about our, our stakeholder partnerships. And we have a program specifically called the Access Area Improvement Initiative. And that initiative enables Duke Energy to partner with entities, typically municipalities, to lease access areas and then manage them as lakefront park spaces, essentially. And lessees manage the access areas and existing facilities, but then they also have the opportunity to construct additional recreation facilities um, or enhance uh, with support facilities. Um, but we go back to that, those facilities have to have a direct nexus to the lake. They have to be specifically related um, or enhanced by being located in those areas. These additional facilities are subject to Duke Energy approval as well as agency consultation and FERC notification because that use is considered as non-project use of project lands. And essentially that just means that it is a use that was not originally contemplated in our license for our recreation management. So these are no cost leases and they're typically valid for the term of the license and any renewals. Um, and that allows, it's particularly important for lessees because it allows them to pursue funding streams such as NC Parks and Recreation Trust Fund grants or similar. So the CRA identified 10 leases to be renewed and 23 new access area leases to be offered. So from partnering and determining the best implementation strategy for facilities, such as location or fishing piers or boat ramps, uh, safety installations that might be key to a site, um, or even leasing lake management zones to allow enforcement of state park rules and regulations. Duke Energy really relies on numerous agencies for the management of recreation areas and facilities. 
So North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, for example, manages the majority of access areas in North Carolina that aren't leased to a municipality or the state under that access area improvement initiative program. Um, sites not leased in South Carolina are, are maintained through a private contractor managed by Duke Energy. And we have an interesting um, commitment in the CRA it identified a new process for us. And so we're currently working to evaluate two commercial lease proposals uh, for a, uh, two identified sites. And we have five sites total in the CRA um, that we were committed to uh, marketing for commercial operators to develop and manage multi-use recreation areas. Um, and so those facilities could include trails, fishing, swimming, camping, and boating access. So we are in the, the process of moving that commitment forward now. Another critical piece of offering recreational opportunities under the Catawba Watery license is recreation flow releases. So the introduction of the recreation flows at Great Falls this year uh, will make five flow release programs on the Catawba Watery. And the license identifies the calendar for those recreation flows and then um, we work with stakeholders through a meeting process to set final dates um, annually. So every year those calendars could look slightly different, but still within the parameters of the license. Uh, flow releases work to balance a variety of recreational users. And so oftentimes a stretch of river will have different or um, sometimes competing recreational uses. And those recreational uses will have different optimal flows. And so if you think about um, a river stretch where kayaking is popular, but also people are tubing it, and then maybe they're also wade fishing it, and then they're also float fishing it, all of those uses have different optimal flow levels. So it's during that process that we really work to ensure that um, we are balancing the uses as well, or as, as best as possible. The license um, and the negotiations that occurred during the licensing process um, handle a good bit of that. And then essentially during our meetings, we're either identifying specific dates or moving things around. Um, it also allows us, for example, the Great Falls calendar. There might be other very similar flows occurring in the region um, in the same season. And so it makes it possible to look at that and try to not um, double up and to spread, spread those flows out so that people can use as many different flows as, as possible, whether it's on that specific river um, or that river versus other similar rivers in the region. So, um, if you recall one of the components of the FERC Order 313, it was to provide public information on recreational opportunities. And so we provide information related to our recreation sites, our flows, lake levels, as well as any specific um, or special messages on both our website and our Lakeview mobile app. Um, and in fact, on the Lakeview mobile app, you can opt to select your preferred lake um, and then get push notifications through your phone. You can get all push notifications if you want, but there's a lot of lakes, so it might be a lot. Um, and, and it will notify you when there is a special message posted specific to that. And that we find that's particularly helpful to our lake neighbors who live on the water, um, who, you know, if you live on Lake Norman, you can select Lake Norman and get the push notification specific to that lake. Um, all that information is also available by calling the 1-800 Lakeline number um, if you prefer not to use, use the internet or the app. So Jimmy talked about challenges and kind of lesson learned, and, and we of course have a number of them as well and, and, um, and relate to his. And so with anything, there's gonna be challenges to development, particularly on the lakes and rivers. Um, and so as noted on, on a previous slide, we had an aggressive build out schedule and uncontrollable conditions such as weather, supply chain challenges, um, they really make an impact on our projects and our timelines. As you can imagine with the majority of our construction projects being on the water, there are a fair number of facilities that are, are built in the water or over the water. And so that has a special or adds a special compounding factor um, high inflows, um, moratoriums, you know, abiding by those, um, and ensuring that we're not having, having negative impacts 
um, all, all go into those schedules. Uh, I would note that another one is that as population growth around the lakes has increased, so has, of course, the demand on the access area. But it also means that plenty of the access areas that were once you know, located in a really remote area with very few neighbors are now surrounded by homes and developments. And so that means we run into uh, neighbor concerns as we go in and we either build new sites or we add facilities to existing sites. And the concerns that we hear are not inconsistent with other types of recreational development. Um, and oftentimes it's related to concerns about increased traffic, uh, noise, potential overcrowding or just, just general site use. And sometimes it's a people just don't want it in their backyard. And sometimes people are excited about it, but they want to know more about how it's going to be managed or they want to talk more about that. Okay, so as I talked about earlier, um, recreational monitoring and evaluation um, is included in the recreation management plan. And we have a couple of, of trigger points for assessing and then um, if we need to um, altering the plan. And so we have recreational use and need studies that are, will occur every 10 years. So we're coming up on the first one of those next year. And then we have recreation specialist meetings that will occur in the seventh and the 14th years of the license. And so we had that first seven year meeting last year with a series of um, stakeholder meetings. Uh, since, since the area is so big, we had one in the upper, one in the middle, and one in the lower of the Catawba area um, in the fall of 2022. And that allowed us to discuss what's been implemented, what's coming, and any alterations that are needed to the plan. And this is really key if you think about it. 15 years ago, most of us wouldn't have thought about ensuring that the canoe slide that we were installing would also accommodate paddle boards because paddle boards weren't really a thing, although I'm aging myself because now 15 years doesn't sound like that long ago. Um, but now that's a given. We know people are gonna use that site for, um, for varying recreation. Uh, but with increased and varied interest of use comes increased opportunity for user conflicts at those sites. Um, and we see that. We talked about that earlier. If we have people, flatwater boaters and whitewater boaters putting it in the same place, or maybe, you know, fishing and boating, um, the busier those sites get, the more opportunity there is for user conflict. And so that just makes it all more, more important that we continue to evaluate and assess the recreational implementation that we're doing um, and work with our stakeholders to ensure that we're implementing our recreation plans in the best manner possible. So I wanted to put our website that is specific to recreation projects on the Catawba Watery here. And I can also drop that, I'll put it in the, in the um, PDF of the slides, Sabrina, so that people have it um, and if, in case they wanna go check that out. Uh, but that's all I have for you. So. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take questions or punt it back to you, Sabrina.